Okay, kids are smoking cigarettes to not get hungry. We, know, we all know that. Um, now, the one thing that a lot of people don't know is that dieting often leads to weight gain. So uh, one of the things that I talk about when I go out and talk about the binge eating population um, is if we are really concerned about our young children, let's not put them on strict diets. You know, let's really watch what we're saying out there in the uh, public schools to our kids about what they weigh and, um, and really look at some of the statistics and the research that shows if you really put them on diets and nothing else too early, they can often just gain weight. Okay, so it's, it's not working. So let's, let's not do it. Uh, 14 to 15 year old girls who engaged in strict dieting are 18 times more likely to develop an eating disorder than the regular population within, you know, within that first year. Okay, so, and why does that happen? So let's, let's hear why that happens. If someone is, is dieting on too low of calories, okay, they set up this whole deprivation um, uh, and, and we've just, and I know that there's been a lot of research on soldiers with deprivation in the concentration camps and also in the uh, first year of the, uh, the conflict, the Iraqi conflict, uh, there was some deprivation in the food sources. And what happens if somebody loses a lot of weight and is deprived, uh, then what the body naturally does is gets hungry. The body is hungry. So often they will, experience this kind of um, you know someone who has the someone who has the right kind of um, personality style will develop anorexia someone who has a different kind of personality style will start binging okay so that's what we're seeing a lot of our soldiers 20% uh, of overweight girls and 6% of overweight boys report using laxatives, vomiting, diuretics, diet pills. Okay, so just statistics that are what kids are doing out there. Okay, uh, some of the things that we know lead to eating disorders. Uh, family studies point to an increased rate of anorexia, bulimia, and adenos in first degree rel relatives. So this one fact really affects our family-based therapy because often what we're finding is that as we're, you know, we're bringing the family in uh, to work uh, with the child and we discover mom uh, has an eating disorder or grandmother has a history of anorexia as well. Uh, twin studies show a very high heritability risk. Okay, so it's, uh, right now at Ed Casa we have two sets of twins. Um, Genes cause childhood behaviors of anxiety, harm avoidance, perfectionism. Those are the, that's uh, the, uh, the anorexics. Inhibition, drive for thinness, and obsessive personality, high sensitivity to stimuli. Those are all of those are uh, the bulimic genes. Elite athletes have higher rates of eating disorders. And elite athletes can have periods, okay? So if you're working with a gymnast or a ballerina, they can have a period, okay? They'll often tell you that they've heard that, oh, it's okay that I don't have a period. They just have to eat more every time there's a competition coming up. Uh, judge sports, the prevalence rate is 13% and 3% in refereed sports. This is really looking at the difference between, um, you know, the refereed sports are football, things like that, the judge sports or things like uh, wrestling, diving. Okay. okay, this is what I want you to know about treatment for eating disorders. There are guidelines. If you're working with people with eating disorders and you don't have these guidelines, please call us and we will send them, we'll fax them to you. Okay, because we really want people to follow these guidelines, okay? Uh, the American Psychiatric Association has guidelines for treatments. Uh, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence has guidelines. I'm going to go over those in, in shortened form. Uh, the types of therapy that they recommend are cognitive behavior therapy, family-based treatment, dialectical behavior therapy, 
Uh, the two new CBTs that have been uh, developed for eating disorders, Integrative and CBTE. And then there's a whole medical necessity uh, packet called Mahalix, which I think I'm pronouncing correct, that looks at the, uh, what to do and what to look for medically. Okay, along with, uh, and we have all of that, and we would happily share that with you that are outpatient therapists. Okay, the, a the American Psychiatric Association guidelines for treatment for eating disorders recommends a team treatment approach. How many of y'all are in private practice, since I keep saying that? Okay, actually not many of you. How many of y'all are in community programs or in a hospital or? Okay, alrighty. If you're working with eating disorders, uh, truly for, the, I'd love to say 30 years, but I think really for 20 years, they've recommended a team approach. And why do they recommend that? Because if you are working solo with someone with an eating disorder, you're missing all the other components to the disorder. Uh, the diso and, and this is for all, of, for all the eating disorders, okay? This is as well for the binge eating population, okay? We really need to have, uh, a, you need to be working with a physician with all the eating disorders, okay? And our, our medical community here in San Antonio, some of them know about eating disorders, but a large majority of them don't. So it is your job, if you're working with an eating disorder, to really know the medical complications and the risks associated with the three different types. And if you don't, we're happy to share that information with you. Got all that. Um, the team treatment includes a, a medical doctor, did I write that already? A, um, a mental health professional, a dietitian. Let's say you, are, are any dietitians in the crowd, in, in the audience? Okay. Uh, it's really important to work with a dietitian that knows eating disorders, and there are plenty here in San Antonio. If you are not a nutritionist, then my recommendation is that you don't function as their nutritionist. Um, and because the specialists in, in the country don't do that, we really know that, you know, I'm a therapist, I'm not a, I'm not a dietitian because I don't know all the medical components of figuring out exactly how many calories somebody should, should use and eat that day, okay, and how to best describe it to them so that it's uh, the least fearful for them. Um, we, you also need, um, okay, so you need a medical component, you need a psychiatric component usually, a mental health component, uh, and a dietary component to your team treatment. Um, and we have all of that at Ed Casa. Uh, the physical symptoms need really, I can't, I can't tell you, even for binge eating disorder, people often forget that sleep apnea is, is really something that you have to take into account and get someone uh, treatment for that. Um, psychiatric intervention with medication, okay. Uh, there is no medication that cures someone for an eating disorder. However, like I said, there's all these comorbid diagnoses that truly help. So if someone is, uh, is you know, has generalized anxiety disorder and they're bulimic, we can use medication for that generalized anxiety disorder. And, and you have to, because if you don't treat that, then you know, how are you gonna uh, really improve that affect state? You may be able to really try to do it with you know, your CBT and DBT therapies, but you also really, really rely on, on medication, okay? As well as for the obsessive compulsive anxiety, okay? Um, and what, what the American Psychiatric Association is recommending that you do is that you use evidence-based treatment, which is what I'm going to go over today. What, what does that mean, evidence-based treatment? And that means treatment that is shown to be effective with the eating disorders. And currently, those are the ones that I have up and that I'm going to talk about. Um, there is, there's current studies, well, I'll say that in a minute. The National Institute for Clinical Excellent Guidelines. This is this is called NICE. For <laughs> okay, um, this is this is their 
guidelines for how to treat someone with an eating disorder. They really come out pretty strong and say that anorexics should really be treated by clinicians and facilities that are competent in working with the physical issues. And what does that mean? It means that uh, you can work with the refeeding syndrome, okay, with careful physical monitoring. Refeeding syndrome is something that happens when someone is refed from a very low weight when they've had the low weight for a significant amount of time. And it's an electrolyte imbalance uh, and in the body and can also, which can kill them. So that is why it is important to, um, you know, if you're working with someone with anorexia to really monitor their, their electrolytes and their cardiac functioning. Um, we have seen last year, um, I hadn't seen this before, someone who uh, got refeeding syndrome in the middle of their inpatient hospital stay, not at the beginning of the refeeding, but after they had gained 20 pounds and then they had 20 more to go. And so right in the middle, it was, it was just a fascinating case. Uh, but it was really great that they were at an eating disorder inpatient facility so that it was caught and monitored. Um, family interventions, okay, this is another thing they're saying, that family interventions that directly address the eating disorder should be offered to child and adolescents with anorexia. This is the family-based treatment. For those of y'all who've heard of the Maudsley treatment, it's just been named uh, family-based, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, the NICE guidelines. Uh, bulimia really needs to be CBT or DBT, and I'll tell you, that's, oh, whoops. That's what they mean by evidence-based for bulimia. And let me tell you, I realize that most of you, you know, when we get a bulimic in, in our offices, and, and y'all too, uh, usually it's just solving crisis after crisis. You know, they'll come to your office in just constant crisis. You know, or they'll enter into your uh, community facility or, or program in just one crisis after another. So that keeps people often from doing CBT and really following, you know, the guidelines that we all know. But I want to recommend that you really do this because otherwise you never get them out of that crisis, crisis mode. Yes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. If someone is, uh, is pregnant with an eating disorder, absolutely. Yeah, abs with an eating disorder uh, with pregnancy, there's really two facilities that I think, inpatient facilities that do really well with that, and I'm happy to tell you about that afterwards, that, that will keep someone and refeed them throughout the pregnancy. Okay. Um, if someone has anorexia throughout the pregnancy, uh, usually that is uh, a little bit easier in an inpatient facility to monitor that. For bulimia, uh, you really have to be willing to fight for your client sometimes with an OB who may say, oh, everybody throws up during a pregnancy. But you really have to talk to them about how someone eats the rest of the day if you've got a bulimic. And that way you'll, you can get them uh, into an inpatient facility. Uh, bulimics often respond well to antidepressant medications, yes, and they also respond well to anti-anxiety medications. Okay, not the, uh, certainly not the ones that are uh, addictive. Cognitive behavioral therapy for bulimics is what the world recommends. Okay, and, and so you really, if you're working with a bulimic, you should be working on CBT. Uh, interpersonal psychotherapy can also be used because of the new findings. I'll talk about that in a minute. DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, is very effective for bulimics and for binge eaters. How many of you in here know dialectical behavior therapy? Okay. How many of you in here know cognitive behavioral therapy? Okay, great. Uh, okay, good. Okay. What is family-based therapy? How many of you in here have heard of family-based therapy? Okay, all right, great, because y'all are working with kids primarily, right? Okay. Family-based therapy really can work. Now, when Ed Casa started uh, here in 2007, we did not have family-based therapy our first year. We put the teenagers in their own track, and, and uh, you know they would come into our facility, similar to a hospital. You know, they'd come into our facility, and we'd have family therapy. 
Well, what we found after that first year is that uh, they would go back home and relapse. Or the family never really learned how to feed them, even though they'd had uh, you know, dietary help, you know, coming in once a week, meeting with a dietitian, but that wasn't enough. So we changed our program, and now our program has family-based therapy. And what does that really mean? It is an outpatient way to restore weight versus having somebody have to go inpatient. Okay. The parents are in charge. Well, the parents have to have education in order to be in charge. Okay. But that is really the whole family unit refeeds the person with anorexia. Okay. The trained therapist, as they're teaching the family and the parents, uh, balances you know the parents' anxiety with their judgment. So they really want to empower the family and yet manage the anxiety usually caused by the food refusal. So there's lots of techniques and how to facilitate and help the family eat. So what we found really helped is that we had a nutrition group for the parents while we had a nutrition group for the kids. Then we would bring them together and eat. That was one day at Ed Casa. Then we taught them therapy together and apart, and then they would eat another day. And then we would talk about, you know, as, and we put them all in family groups together because we found that if a child or an adolescent won't eat with their mother, mm, they're going to eat for their friend's mother. So it really became very effective to group them and that way everyone ate better and they learned things and they became friends and they could all talk and then the parents also got support from each other. Okay, so our program is a 10 hour a week, uh, three day a week program and it's in the evening so that parents can really come and learn the skills to, to help their kid. Uh, the research really shows this, that separated treatment is better if you have a divorced family or a conflictual family. Often when I'm talking to insurance companies, if we have chosen to put a teenager into our, one of our other programs, it's because we do not think that the family structure can feed the child. Okay? And that does happen periodically. Okay. Um, and I want you to think about the kids that you've worked with. Uh, as you know, if the family structure can really hold the anxiety and get them to, to eat and follow a meal plan, you know, and that's hard to do when that child is fearful, 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 or they're a teenager taller than the parent, you know, and is refusing to do it. You have to have a family that sticks together and the parents working together. Okay. But it is highly effective, okay? So they've done a lot of research on the family-based approach for anorexia with children and adolescents. It is highly effective and it is, and look at the beneficial effects, are sustained at a five-year follow-up. I don't truly believe that they've done 10-year follow-ups yet, okay. but it is very effective. So for those of y'all in here, are y'all using that kind of treatment with eating disorders? Anybody, anybody using that yet? Or just, okay. But it's really effective, so think about that. <clears throat> when you, you know, if, if y'all are uh, inpatient and you are here going, oh gosh, I've got to refer this uh, person with an eating disorder out to a therapist, that's one of the things you may want to ask them. Do you use family-based treatment for this 12-year-old? And if they say, no, I sure don't because, you know, the family's too conflictual, you go, okay, I can understand that, you know, you'll have to, uh, you know, work other ways with them. Uh, but otherwise, really push that because that is what is found to be effective. And that's what they mean by evidence-based treatment, okay?